Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our third lecture in the series on visual cultures at UC Berkeley. I want to thank BAM PFA and, uh, of course, the Arts and Design uh, group for hosting us and for making this all possible, and our, our key funders, the Letters and Sciences, uh, the Division of Letters and Sciences at UC Berkeley, for making it possible for us all to enjoy lectures by artists about visual aesthetics and visual cultures for free. I want to share with you a couple slides quickly. My name is Greg Niemeyer. I'm the organizer and convener of this series, and I want to introduce you to uh, my co-organizers here, Paris Coates and uh, Hala Kadura and Edgar Frias. And together, we're going to guide you through the talk today by Tiare Ribot. Before we get started with that, I want to share a few slides here uh, to, there we go, to uh, speak about uh, what we're doing in class. So uh, our current experiment of the week, if you want to participate, is uh, how not to be seen. And the prompt is to have a photo or video taken of yourself in an original camouflage outfit that blends in with a specific environment. This, of course, resonates both with uh, the talk we had last week by Ariana Schindler, but perhaps also with Tiara's comments about how we can tend to the environment best. And uh, so going right along, we're going to go to a few protocol points. I wanted to mention that the um, uh, Q&A is open, so please do send questions to us. We love your questions. Sometimes we get 20, sometimes we get 30, and we'll figure out how to blend them and combine them and maybe call on you to ask your question directly personally so you can be unmuted and uh, uh, present your question directly. And uh, what else? So there's a chat feature, of course, and the chat feature allows you to talk to us, to talk to each other, and uh, we're going to keep it open um, as long as it all makes sense. And uh, we ask you to uh, observe community standards and be respectful in comments. Uh, so far, we had no problems with that, so we're really happy about that civic space that opens up in which we can all talk to each other freely. So um, it's my honor now to introduce Tiara Ribo, Hawaiian native artist and curator. Tiara Ribo blends indigenous epistemologies of ecology with radical material research in hopes of leveraging native values with contemporary research methods. Whenever I meet Tiara, usually uh, she wears uh, some bioplastic that she created or talks about some uh, uh, adventure out in the world that um, uh, allows her to ask questions that nobody else asks. So this is a very concrete practice, a very embodied practice. Her work with uh, bioplastics for clothing continues the discussion about how the basic materials we can use we, we use can be a site for cultural renewal and how the body is ground zero for a more sustainable planet. She sees biodegradable bioplastics as a real alternative to plastics, which indeed pollute the oceans. Plastiglomerates, a new word, plastiglomerates, geological manifestations of plastic waste in the active zones of Hawaiian volcanoes, are her call to action. And with her, we are all called to action to reconnect to our reverence to nature and the environment in order to maintain balance and recognize our role as stewards of the land. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Tiara Ribot for our talk today. Thank you so much. Wild applause, inaudible, but here we roll. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. I'm going to turn on the spotlight to Tiara. How are you doing today? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm great. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak. It is an honor to be here as a guest um, and to share my practice. You're most so, welcome. Where are you reaching us from? Um, well, I am based out of Oakland, uh, originally from Honolulu, Hawaii, and um, I'm calling in from Palm Springs. Excellent. <laughs> well, um, uh, uh, let's let's roll. Um, I can't wait to hear about your your current research and updates and uh, how your visual aesthetic came about. Yeah. Um, so, as Greg mentioned, I'm a new media artist and. Uh, have an interdisciplinary practice. Uh, I also work in filmmaking and I used uh, web-based art, fashion, film, and bio art uh, to um, kind of express and explore the entanglements between humans, the technologies we use, and the environment and the ecologies we impact, um, as well as non-human species. Um, and in a in addition to my arts practice, I founded the New Media Arts Space Big Lab, based out of Oakland in 2014. 
as a platform for underrepresented artists uh, to showcase work via exhibition and performance and also gathering together in community uh, to create space and hold space for each other um, in uh, discourse and dialogue about you know the issues uh, that we face every day both uh, so socially economically and um, all of the all of the layers that make us up as a society um, We've had to go on hiatus as an art space since April uh, due to the pandemic, but are relaunching an online exhibition series, uh, hopefully in October, uh, with the artist Linnea Billingsley, who is a local artist in Oakland, and Hisu Kwan, uh, whose work I highly recommend checking out. Um, I'm going to go into uh, screen share now. And uh, talk among slides. So um, I like how I, every time my name is uh, <laughs> in like Google Slides, it's like incorrect spelling. <laughs> I don't know how often that is for others. Um, so in my personal practice, uh, I use uh, storytelling to really reveal social and economical imbalances uh, while imagining more regenerative futures as kind of the uh, title of this talk presents. Um, I think it's especially important and powerful as we see, again, like in California, the world is burning around us. Um, as we see in America, our systems are extremely broken. And storytelling can really help shape the future by offering perspectives into new alternatives. Uh, and I think it's important to talk about how we can employ and, and integrate indigenous technologies uh, with modern technologies. Um, and in Hawaii, we call uh, storytelling mo'olalo, which is also passed down from uh, our ancestors. Um, so how do we yeah, continue to tell our stories? Uh, you know, for me, I'd like to incorporate it from a perspective uh, that I grew up with so as to really strengthen the survival of these stories, because that is how we survive and persist as, as, a pe as peoples. Um, for this lecture, I'm going to focus on a few personal projects that do this, uh, as well as live on both sides of the screen, uh, existing both on the web and in physical reality, um, as well as like some upcoming uh, projects that I'm thinking about. Uh, the first project I'm going to discuss is uh, a, a, a web, both a web-based project and a physical-based practice. Um, and it kind of was seeded with this Bioplastics Cookbook for Ritual Healing from Petrochemical Landscapes uh, that I created for the Planetary Glitch uh, theme from uh, with Academy Schloss Solitude and ZKM uh, as a web resident. So this was uh, had a this was a web residency that um, uh, basically ended up as a, a website. Um, and I created this from what felt as, like an urgent need to bring awareness to um, our, shifting our collective material relationships, including my own, and to move away from our petrochemical dependencies uh, and consumption around plastics. Um, so we have a strange relationship to materials uh, as a culture and deep time. Um, and through this cookbook, I wanted to reconfigure and expand both the uh, my own personal knowledge and public knowledge of uh, creating bioplastics and biodegra biodegradable materials um, from home and taking agency to be able to really, uh, yeah, kind of like create materials that you use every day um, back kind of like in, in our own homes. And kind of, um, I, I would show the website itself, but it takes up a lot of bandwidth. So I'm just sharing some kind of like uh, screenshots from the website um, and within it there are also kind of like it's kind of like a choose your own adventure you can go into actual protocols or you can learn how, the recipes for how to make these materials or you can learn about um, these non-human species such as salvations uh, these these microbes that break down um, PET plastics um, that are really entangled in this web of the plasticine that we've created in the world um, and I created this website uh, 
really inspired by the Additivist Cookbook, uh, created by Morishin Aliari and Daniel Rourke. Um, and their cookbook, uh, which I don't have a slide of, but it, it really emphasizes how to subvert uh, and use the tool of 3D printing uh, for more of an activist and political role other than just for consumption. Uh, through, I think, about a hundred projects uh, that kind of take this, take, take that, um, uh, f you know, philosophy and mission of sub subversion and rethinking about our consum consumption uh, to kind of, uh, yeah, create um, kind of politically charged um, pieces. So that's, you know, where I drew inspiration from. Um, and with this, I wanted to, again, give people agency and how to take things into their own homes um, and, and try and, again, create materials themselves. Um, so uh, here's kind of like a list of basic materials you can need. You don't really need more than a kitchen and some basic ingredients. Um, and then I gave protocols into how to um, create those materials. And really what you can, it's, it's really creating a solution there's no like really um, advanced science that you have to do to uh, create these materials. It, it can get very advanced uh, in the actual manufacture of these kind of mat materials, which I'm not doing on like a scalable level. Um, you know, it can get quite more complex when you're adding like uh, fixatives into them. But for, for me, it was more just the act of making them as a ritual. Um, and again, to reclaim agency of like, what is what does it mean to kind of, uh, create the ma materials that you use for art making, for, for clothing, for, um, the, you know, kind of like infrastructural type things uh, from scratch. And what is, how does that change your relationship to them? Um, so again, I started just um, working from the basic protocols, uh, changing them, tweaking ratios uh, to what worked and, and to what I liked uh, kind of aesthetically. Um, and in doing this myself, I learned that it's a little uh, climate and season dependent um, and the materials kind of like slowly change over time. Uh, and my whole relationship to materials actually changed uh, in the process of making them. Uh, so again, they're solutions that you pour out, uh, they're liquid solutions that you pour out and they dry um, sometimes uh, from, it'll take like two to five days. Um, and, you know, it, it shifted, my, my relationship to materials kind of shifted um, to this place of participatory integration and entanglement with the material, uh, working with these derivatives of living matter uh, and, and bringing them into existence, giving them kind of a new life of their own. So, you know, uh, uh, they, they really transmute from solid to liquid to solid. Um, and they, and I was also transformed in the process and, um, my relationship to time also changed as it, it, you know, there's a lot of patience that goes into waiting for them to dry. Um, there was also an ethics of care I was embedding into them, uh, shaping the sheets over form, sometimes ripping them in the pro process as they're quite fragile. Um, and so, and sometimes they're quite strong. Um, ultimately, you know, they, the materials would do what they wanted. Um, and I was essentially creating new material entanglements um, with, uh, the mater with, with these materials. I realize I'm just plugging my computer one second. Just, um, I'll leave you on this slide. I love how she said that um, she was transformed in the process that was making this material as well. And I wonder how we all are transformed by the materials we're interacting with. It makes us different people in some way, of course, and uh, it's a very good question.
Yeah, well, what, one, one, when we touch that material, it just feels um, very lively and fluid, just like it looks, actually. Hi, Tiara. There was some, welcome back. There was some discussion about how much fun it is to touch your materials. Everyone, so sorry about that. Welcome back. There was so much discussion about how much fun it is to touch your materials. Have we all uh, <laughs> touched them right now? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I left it at this like uh, specifically tactile slide. So um, thanks for your patience. Um, okay. So yeah, I was talking kind of like about uh, yeah uh, this ethics of, of care that I was embedding to the materials and and. I've given workshops and kind of talked about this as well um, as I'm making this with groups. Um, so it, it's, yeah, there is like a tactile quality that's really fun to explore. Um, yeah, so uh, all the recipes, again, were shared online, open source, and uh, my resources honestly were initially from others who were sharing their processes on the web and their trial and error, error methods. And essentially there's this network that was created um, with online resources. And I saw this as kind of ex an expansion of a library for these bio-based materials and, and being a part of the global network of people who are creating bioplastics. And also really as a provocation to like how we can shift uh, our material relationships and also what are alternatives. You know, again, I'm not making these scalable, um, but others are, and it's, it's, it's again a provocation into thinking about new ways of both relating to materials as well as what can exist in the world as an alternative to uh, petrochemical plastic consumption. I also started thinking and playing with ideas of expanding the body, uh, new forms of biotextiles. I could, yeah, create as extensions of the body, new skin. speculative for now uh, but necessary to begin to consider how we can again create new textiles from plant, plant materials or food waste how to shift multiple ways of being and living uh, with other species beyond our current relationship to them uh, in the world after doing oh and here's some masks that are very um, yeah not very practical but again just a uh, playful exploration into uh, what can yeah they look like in different forms on the body. Uh, after doing the web residency uh, that I mentioned with uh, Academy Schloss Solitude and ZKM, uh, they're based in Germany and I was actually brought out to Stuttgart, Germany, right before the pandem pandemic hit um, in February to create sculptures for an exhibition called Our Loves Are More Than Human at Academy Sch Solitude's gallery uh, who commissioned the website. They, um, and this was shown as physical objects in the space that people could touch at the time. Uh, and they allowed me to explore more sculptural forms. And this was also shown alongside the website on display that you could interact with and kind of really get engaged with uh, the different, uh, again, stories and recipes, as well as alongside other works uh, that were really powerful that were talking, again, about our relationship to other species and our planet. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a really great program to be involved in as it allowed for a cohort of artists to connect with who are making great work. There was this hash award that I was a part of, uh, where all the artists presented their works and, uh, I wanted to quickly do a shout out to Natasha Tante, based in, in Indonesia, who won the hash award earlier this year for her project Pest Tower that was really an argument for cockroaches, which we often exterminate, which we often like hate as pests, um, who've lived millions of years, you know, before us. And we don't think about in terms of like the anthropocentric perspective of that, that we kill, you know, we kill every pest that we see or that comes near our home. In Hawaii, and I'm guessing in Indonesia, you know, they, they thrive and they live everywhere in the tropics and you learn to just live among them. And she was really kind of making an argument for the roach as uh, how, how can we <laughs> learn to like love and live among the pests, what we see as pests. Um, so just a quick, quick shout out. 
one of the, p the pages and uh, uh, kind of a theme and a focus of my research for the bioplastics website was about plastiglomerate, which uh, you mentioned in the beginning, Greg, and its uh, relationship to the goddess Pele. And it actually became a whole other body of work and research that I uh, built around this topic. And uh, again, looking at the relationship between a plastiglomerate and the goddess Pele. Pele Honiomea is a volcano goddess uh, related to Kilauea and the active volcano on the island of Hawaii. Um, where plastic armor was discovered and where animistic spirituality meets post, the post-consumer debris of the technosphere. And I was thinking a lot about how, uh, if there can be spiritualities embedded in the materials in Hawaii, as again, there's a, there is uh, this elemental goddess, Pele, and there's really a pantheon of elemental gods uh, for the Kanaka Maui, and I grew up with these beliefs embedded in me growing up in Hawaii. Um, so this is around where plastic glomerate was discovered in, on Camilo Beach in Kau. Uh, the heat from bonfires on the beaches melted together uh, with this littered plastic debris uh, floated in from Pacific uh, garbage gyres and the sand and rock uh, melted together with these created this conglomerate um, that forms a uh, plastic armor. And since the, the island of Hawaii is associated with Kalehonomea, uh, you could say that the, the actual land on the, of the island of Hawaii is Pele's sacred body. And it was formed you know, from these volcanic magma flows. Uh, the land is considered alive, and the land is, is the body of, of the goddess. And, Pele is seen, you know, to Hawaiians as uh, their, their ancestor too, as, as um, you know, a, anyone, often people kind of relate to the gods as, and the land as being from where they are descended. So it's a really a different relationship that people have to the land and the Hawaiians had to the island. Um, Pele's poetic name is Kawahine Aihonua, uh, the woman to be translated as like the woman who devours the land. And she's a goddess kind of both of creation and destruction. And I couldn't help but see the parallels to plastic. As one can say, you know, the very nature of plastic is also one of creation and destruction, enabling new materials, forms, technologies on the planet, yet also landscapes of garbage, fields of extraction, kind of this ominous substance that can uh, destroy and or alter ecosystems on earth and also create these these layers of new strata of the again this plastic glomerate. So um, after doing initial research um, I, I created this new body of work around this topic for an exhibition last year in Honolulu Hawaii called Contact uh, and it was really exploring kind of it was it was based at this really interesting site at the Hawaiian Mission Houses um, which was the first Western building built on Oahu uh, for the missionary settlers, you know? So it's this kind of uh, contentious space of like, uh, the exhibition specifically looked at kind of modern spirituality from a Hawaiian perspective in, you know, 2019 at this site where like the first settlers lived and really sh shifted, you know, Hawaiian spiritual beliefs away from you know, this elemental worship to worshiping one God. So from a pantheon of gods to one God. So it was this contentious space, um, and, but also a powerful space to reintroduce native spirituality. Uh, and it was a group exhibition with other artists. And I was really just honored to be a part of it. And also to come full, full circle, I hadn't sh shared my work in Hawaii for almost 10 years. So it was an amazing homecoming to be invited back to this space. And, you know, at the opening of the exhibition, it was not like your typical, you know, white box that you would enter in maybe like the Bay Area often, although I think that's shifting in the landscape of, you know, uh, the pandemic. But this was, you know, the, the opening was outdoors. There was an Oli, there was a chant to welcome and greet people to the space. And then they called all the artists to, you know, the, the main kind of like stage. Uh, they gave us all lay. 
and then they had us sing um, a song in Hawaiian, which uh, since we were all part Hawaiian, we all knew and grew up with. So it was beautiful. I literally cried at the opening, and it was this way of like welcoming people into this space with like um, again this very beautiful welcoming gesture that was not typically what you would see at an art opening. Yeah. Um, so uh, for this work, I created bioplastics that I wrapped around rocks, kind of as offerings. Uh, the rock stayed on Hawaii. Um, and it was an immersive installation using a uh, two-channel video. I'm going to switch now from slides to, um, and I also use a uh, fabric that I printed on. Uh, I'm just going to go full screen with this. And so these are some images um, from the exhibition. And I had like a print of Helen Ma'u Ma'u Crater, which is uh, the active crater where uh, there is still volcanic eruption. And as, as a new work, the project kind of evolved to consider also the mediation of Hawaii Island uh, via kind of te technological monitoring. So um, there is a whole kind of geological monitoring center above Helen Ma'u Ma'u Crater that looks into it, that kind of tries to predict the flows of of Kilauea and there's all this kind of like uh, point cloud data of also um, the craters which were at one point sacred. You could not approach the, the crater of Hale Ma'u Ma'u without like giving offerings to Pele, without you know showing like deep respect and reverence and now just you know everybody you know anyone from anywhere can drive up to to the crater and look into it without the same respect and reverence. So it's really a shift from, uh, again, kind of like, uh, you know, what, what, what was. And I think that's, you know, therein lies the problem with a lot of what's happening today is we, we've lost our respect for nature and especially for these, you know, and I think the, the volcano is especially one that holds this kind of awe-inspiring, you know, moment. I'm going to play this kind of two-channel. It's, it's smaller, but um, you can get a sense of kind of how this was set up in the, in the gallery. So it showed uh, the three kind of like more of the technological side of things, how, how the, the volcano is mapped versus the actual flows of the lava. And I'm just going to show parts of it and skip ahead as I talk over it. Is that okay? Can you still hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you fine. We can't hear the sound of the video though. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just talk over it then. Yeah. Um, this is all very interesting. You're getting a lot of good feedback on the chat as we're going along here. So, I, you know, I bring in plastic conglomerate as a, as kind of a metaphor for the loss of native spiritual beliefs again with the continuous arrival of like settlers, colonialists, and their new materials and technologies, you know, that have kind of like melded again with, you know, what is sacred. Um, and as an extension of techno-colonialism, you know, this, there's satellite monitoring that happens uh, through all sorts of active imaging, such as LIDAR and INSAR. Um, that literally shoot lasers on the land to detect, to detect uh, surface deformations at Kilauea summit. It's these kind of three, three dimensional, I don't know if you can see it actually, I can maybe make this bigger. Um, so there are these three dimensional uh, mappings of, of the crater. And this could be maybe seen as an invasion of, of her sacred body as well, just with this active imaging. And it's kind of shifting the perspective of like what was once, you know, of what is a god. You have the eye looking down at the crater of, you know, a uh, former goddess. And it kind of, I was thinking of how, how do we reposition this next to the actual flows of the crater to kind of re-inspire awe and wonder. Um, so I wanted to also show uh, some of the flows of the, here we go. So these are just some, some of the flows of the active volcano. And I think I might need to rejoin for audio, but I think it's fine without it as well. So 
again, how do we kind of re shift our perspective for, for reverence to nature? And this can happen by really kind of, you know, looking at the two uh, juxtaposed and, and calling us back to, to have this reverence. And, um, okay. There's, it's on my website, it's a two channel, which isn't the best uh, representation of it, but I am going to create an online gallery uh, with these works um, in this platform called New York City that was in the, uh, created by Don Hansen, and it'll be like this experience where you can walk in and kind of see this exhibition again um, in the browser as it was installed in this uh, exhibition on Hawaii. So hopefully, I, I hope to have that up in the next few weeks. And I'm going, that, that kind of leads me back to another project uh, that I had put together for um, uh, this YBCA gallery uh, that was called A Verbo's Proxy for Place. And this was curated by Tiffany Yao and had a, ex the exhibition design was by Victoire Comadere and the uh, exhibition production uh, in Unity was by Macrowaves. And this is an online exhibition that exists now. Uh, it opened uh, in late August and it is just up uh, indefinitely, so to speak, online. And yeah, it was an amazing exhibition because it brought together artists who were really exploring what it meant to be home in this time of kind of displacement from home, especially for those of us who live uh, outside of our place of birth. And as I mentioned, I'm originally from Hawaii and I haven't actually been able to travel home uh, due to the pandemic and the very restrictive uh, restrictive quarantine regulations around uh, re-entering the islands. So I've just taken the time to honestly re-explore my relationship to, to Honolulu during this time. And through this project uh, called Ike, Ike Va Ika Vailala, Ika Moana, or Towards the Waterfall, Towards the Ocean. Um, it really, it, I kind of explored my experience living in the and uh, through kind of these uh, photogram photogrammetric models of, of rocks that I encountered during different hikes on my visits home, images that I've taken. I usually visit home once a year and I haven't been in over a year now. And, and these are kind of like images that I, that I captured um, during my visits that were that stood out to me and and they were a way of both sharing um what i consider as home uh both my both not just my family but also the land the soil the ocean uh these kind of these elements that, that make up the islands that, that i consider like my relatives uh the koolaos um it was really exploring, again, entry points into these places uh, as they relate to memory. And the initial image that you, show, you had shown, this is actually a picture of a street uh, in Palola Valley where I grew up that leads to a childhood home. Um, and this is, a, this is often an image this on the left here that I come back to on Google Maps when I get homesick. I'll go to like Street View and try and get as far back into the valley as I can. And, and this is when I took in, in person when I was there. But usually when I go home, this is one of the first places I go um, is down Waiamao Road. And just to, you know, I usually go on Google Maps when I'm back on the road <laughs> to um, be there in person. And there is this trail that last time I was on, on the islands, I had to install for this exhibition, you know, that I just mentioned, but I went up Pa'au Crater Trail, which is a really hard trail to do. You have to climb three waterfalls to get to the top of this crater. Um, but I went, because I was just like, I need, to, I need to get my face in it, you know, I need to get like dirt under my nails and get, I have to like, climb these ropes. Um, but, but what you see on the right is uh, this image of this pipe, kind of where it's, it's a lot of water is rerouted from the watersheds where the developments on, in Honolulu, and um, you really see that visibly when you're on those hikes that go to the waterfall trails, or these trails that go to the waterfall, um, because they're going, you know, ultimately to the source of the water. So yeah, these are a few images from the exhibition. And um, yeah, something that I wanted to briefly talk about is just, uh, you know, again, during this time what, that I haven't been able to travel home, I've actually reconnected a lot 
more and had a lot more questions about my heritage and been reaching out to my um, my father's side where where I uh, have a connection to Hawaiian heritage. And I realized, um, not just during this time, but we got deeper into my ancestry and I, I have, um, I'm descended also from uh, the island of Maui and I have on the, on, on my father's side, uh, the, the, the family of Kavai'aias and a specific place in Kaupo that uh, is a vahipana, which is like a, a sacred place to the Hawaiians that ha has to do with kind of the way that the river flows through the land and the wind and the geological features. And it's also, it was a huge gathering place, uh, but is now almost like, I would say like a small village uh, or it's just like like ranchers or just a few people kind of scattered on that land. But but we have actual, there is land that connects back to the family line and it's kind of like this new, almost, I don't, yeah, this new place that I want to journey to connect to home. So I've been talking, I've been talking to relatives online about these stories of my family and it's been really powerful to reconnect even though I'm not there. Um, okay, the next project I wanted to discuss briefly is a short film called Santa Visions uh, that I created uh, and co-directed with Jody Stillwater which explores themes related to, again, kind of our relationship to the environment, uh, also biotechnology and how our bodies might change and become symbiotic with other species as we face climate catastrophe. Um, and we just actually finished a new cut for uh, the De Young Museum for their, uh, the De Young Open exhibition. I'm not sure when that will open, but it, it was, it was the first time they had an open call and they are showing local artists. I think, I don't know, 800 artists or something amazing like that. Uh, I'm not sure when it'll open, but uh, yeah, keep your eye out for it. Um, and this, this first image uh, in near the Mendocino complex fires of 2018, right before the, the Paradise fires that people in California definitely remember. Um, so it's a, a bit relevant now as we are facing, you know, this outbreak of fires in everyone in California and, and Oregon. And, uh, you know, we, it's, it's just, it's a visual narrative film that, that asks us to really seriously rethink our relationship to the ecosystems we live adjacent to and our impact, the impact of our lifestyles that are very far from being in balance with the land. So um, I'm going to play a few minutes of this film. And kind of wrap up. I think this is, yeah. Oh, I don't have sound. Um, is that okay? Should I rejoin the sound or? No, you can stop sharing. Okay. And then uh, when you start sharing again, click use computer sound and then it'll play. Yes. There's that little button on the left. Okay, great. And now it should work.
Now I want to see the whole thing. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, um, I can send people a link. So we have, uh, it's a, there's a 15 minute version of the film uh, for those people who are interested. Um, and it will again be as a video installation at the Beyond at some point so when we can go back to museums. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, I guess that's it for now. And I'd love to answer any questions. Um, really, yeah, my work kind of, again, spans a few different places. So um, I didn't get too much into Santa Visions, but I'm happy to discuss uh, that project in more detail as well, because it it's kind of a mysterious, you know, array of images. So uh, I can go deeper into that project uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Applause. Applause, applause, applause. Um, so we have a whole bunch of questions here, and I'm going to pass it on to Hala and Edgar to um, do the question and answer session. And uh, thank you so much for a fabulous and inspiring talk. I was very struck just now with the shift of uh, scale, how you go from the lab to the land, and uh, how, the, you know, of course, the principles that you look at in the lab, they scale up to the whole globe. And uh, I just wonder if you had any thoughts about how, say, plastic glomerates and all these things, the scale of it all is just massive, right? And, and uh, how, do you, how do you bridge that experience of like the lab scale, the tactile scale, and then the global scale? Sorry, could you, <laughs> how do I, sorry. How, how, do you, how do you bridge in your mind the, the you know, the awareness that you learn about things by touching and by working in the lab and then realizing that at the same time what you're doing is happening on a global scale and and so there's two radically different scales that are working, right? One, the scale of our understanding of something that's before us as you demonstrate in the lab video and then the scale at which it actually happens which is an entire island or the entire globe really and how do you, how do you jump between these two scales? Like, that, doesn't that, that must hurt in the head somehow. I mean, it just hurts watching it, and it, it hurts because it's, it's kind of a pain of compassion of like, wow, all these things that are wrong are happening on such a large scale as well, you know? So I'm wondering how you bridge that in your, in, when you think about your work. Well, honestly, I, when I first, I worked for two brief stints in, in, in biotech as a lab uh, technician, just for like six to eight month periods and, uh, I never, got, I never, I don't have a degree in, in biology or anything like this, but it was an entry point into the space of examining the, the very microscopic parts of what makes things alive. And my first glimpse into the microscope that I, that I remember really uh, bringing awe and kind of, it felt like I was looking into another universe. It was just, I think, an arrangement of algae, like it was a drop of water. And, I, and I've heard other people say this, but when you look into a drop of water, you see that there's this whole other ecosystem. There's like like hundreds of thousands of other organisms that live within that one drop, just different bacteria and um, protozoa. And it's, it's really just an exciting space. And it just it felt like looking into, um, I don't know, it just felt like a portal again into another universe, but this is our Earth, you know, we're made of these many, many multi multifaceted and this multitude of, of organisms that make a, a larger um, whole. So I think, you know, my experience wasn't pain <laughs> looking into it, it was just like wonder and kind of, uh, I was hypnotized. Um, and have, in, in Santa Visions, the film, there's these scenes of, uh, me, uh, of looking into like a petri dish of fungus growing of, of mycelium and then comparing those to kind of like these landscapes of, of the salt ponds that you saw at the, at the end of the video clip that I showed um, and these are in the South Bay uh, and and they look very similar you know and yeah. um, and you're also greeted with this image this macro image of, of the burnt forest uh, in, in the first scene of Santa Visions but you know, also when you kind of look at the details, you know, I mean, one of the one of the issues with, with the fires is that they grow up, the, the trees grow up closer to each other. And, and what I saw when I was at at the site of, of 
uh, the burnt trees was that the trees were growing up among them, you know, that the trees were regrowing, but they were too close to each other. But there, it's cyclical. There is no real death on the planet, you know, nothing really dies. It just becomes transmuted into something else. So I'm hopeful, you know, in, in the face of like what, this, what feels apocalyptic with these skies in the Bay Area and the smoke, it's like, well, the, the earth is by nature regenerate, regenerate, <laughs> that's the word that's regenerative, the regenerative um, by nature uh, is nature is regenerative cells are regenerative for the most part um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can start to recognize how to apply this natural pr principle of regeneration into everything we do and now on to Hala and Edgar Chris thank you so much for this incredible inspiring um just lecture and I love your attitude of being about being helpful and how we see how you see the world and how it's because a lot of people just talk about the opposite how everything is ending um, so I'm gonna now move to a question from our students her name is Alyssa and the question is could you see your bioplastic clothing technique becoming more widespread would you want it to become popular as an alternative to things like fast fashion or do you see it as a more of your own unique art form? Well, absolutely. It's a provocation, I think, to any sort of textile manufacturer to start to use these materials. I would, I would love to see these type of kind of plant-based materials uh, integrated into manufacturing on all levels, whether it's like one-time use plastic bags that we still, you know, we have the compostable bags in our grocery stores, but they're not actually compostable. So they still require this kind of like high amount of heat and pressure. They can't, you can't just like leave them on the side of the road and they're not gonna decompress or decompose. Um, I actually, I forgot, uh, Greg made a request to bring samples and I have some here with me of the materials. So here's the one that looks kind of like a mouse. Um, but yeah, I, I, I am all about the circular economy and I feel like it would be great to see these integrated on a larger scale. And I think that, you know, one of the job, one of my, I feel like my role as an artist in creating these works and kind of, you know, having them at times like go viral on Instagram or something, if you make them really well, comp like a beautiful composition of a bioplastic, you know, eventually it will seed out to people who are making these garments and they will, you know, the hope is that eventually like, like imagine if like Nike or some shit uses this, excuse my language, like use more biodegradable materials or any anyone who's making any sort of large scale uh, garment manufacturing like it, it's a huge shift um, and again if 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 when you create it on scale that would be that would be amazing That's so cool. Thank you so much for showing uh, your piece and material. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was so incredible. So grateful for everything you've been showing us. And we definitely have a lot of questions. Um, the first one I wanted to ask you is kind of connected to what we've been talking about. Alan from our class, Alan Liang asks, how does bioplastics as a material translate to the longevity of your clothing? I'm really passionate about sustainable fashion, but I know a concern is that some bioplastic materials could not be as robust or long lasting. Yeah, that, that is a huge challenge. The ones that I'm making and the recipes that I have online aren't necessarily for very practical use. Again, my practice is more about a publication and kind of embedding the story and uh, offering agency to anyone who wants to try and create materials. But there involves a little bit more research and a little bit more application of other ingredients that are fixatives um, and sealants to, to make it more uh, robust and uh, uh, less biodegradable. We want it to be in this kind of space between biodegradable and not, because you know, if you were to wear a raincoat out in the rain, it could start to uh, decompose made of this stuff. That being said, again, I, it just takes a little bit more research. Uh, my practice is more of a provocation to get people interested in this, alternative of creating materials. Um, 
And if you, there, there are people who are doing this. Um, and I can, what I can do um, is, yeah, link, link the group, or I don't know if we're sending out an email after, but there is, um, or I'll add it to my website, my bioplastics website. But what I really need to do is link people to keep to others who are doing this in the textile and fashion, fashion or materials uh, industries um, to see what's possible um, in terms of like, yeah, how, how to make it more long term and how to, uh, yeah, just, just make, these, make these last. But honestly, they can. I mean, these, some of these pieces that, I, that I've made have lasted like two years. So, um, you know, a lot of us are spending time indoors. So if we want like a bioplastic look for our Zoom call, very much, I will push for that, you know. <laughs> um, but again, uh, I, I see that someone's commenting. Yeah, it's, I think not just the, the textile industry, I think what, what really needs to be applied is this one time is kind of the, the amount of plastic that we throw away, you know, from, mm -hmm. from e even when they, they employ this law that only allows for paper bags. People are still using plastic bags. This, this is a simple thing, plastic bottles, you know? If we just shift it so we don't have this um, and we're able to use uh, more, yeah, biodegradable materials, then, then that's a major, major change. Thank you, Yeah, and I love the way you're saying it, kind of that invitation, right, for collaborators or people to explore this, to move into this route. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Okay, I'm gonna take a question from the Q&A and it's by William Day. So William, if you wanna ask directly the question. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes okay, you I, just, I just wanted to ask, what are some of the biggest challenges associated with like you said, implementing bioplastics into clothing and maybe some of the other sectors that you're talking about, like containers. Uh, yeah. Sorry, what are the biggest obstacles? Or yeah, challenges? biggest obstacles or challenges. I think it's 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 the infrastructure that we're living. In. So we're here is that um, the infrastructure to make actual uh, like petrochemical plastic, commercial plastics, is already in place. And um, we don't quite have the, inf and it's very cheap to make, you know, it's, it's still very, very cheap. So people who are looking for profit in, uh, you know, our capitalist society, um, they will look for the cheapest material, you know? And I feel like people are starting to lean towards like, uh, you know, starting to finally, like, as consumers, we're like, okay, I won't always buy what's the most cheap. I want to buy what will last the longest or what maybe has more craft and, you know, embedded into it. Um, like for artisan, like artisan products, um, we see that with like food in the Bay, <laughs> um, the $10 avocado toast or whatever. But um, it, I see that kind of applying to materials and, and the, the obstacle is the infrastructure. So the, the I, I studied a biofuel from algae or I worked, when I worked in, in a, as a lab technician, I was, we were trying to scale uh, bio, biofuel from algae. And the thing is, there's just not the infrastructure to use biofuel in our gas station. You go, you drive around America, you're not gonna see like the biofuel option at the gas station. So that has to be like built into the infrastructure. Same with plastics. We don't have large scale manufacturers to make these kind of um, materials yet. So it takes a radical shift and kind of like an investment from major companies and corporations into making these. And, you know, that's not something I have the power to do, but I can add the cool factor <laughs> of being like, you know, um, you know, this is what it could look like. And this is why, you know, we should start to use them. And it's, it's important to invest in, but, but, you know, it'll take these larger companies to shift their infrastructure uh, to actually, you know, start to employ these materials to, to be used that are very possible to make. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And, and the next question is from someone who I'm hoping is still here. Um, Mar Cabral, you have a question in the Q&A if you want to ask. Mar, you're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi. Um, so I loved how you were talking about film and storytelling and how storytelling can be used in like a political and social context. So I was curious, how do you feel about the stories that are being told right now? And where do you see the potential of these stories going or developing? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny because I remember just a few years ago, there were all these like apocalyptic movies coming out. And now it like feels a little bit like we're living in those <laughs> stories. And I feel like we have to be very careful as to what kind of stories we tell because they, that's, that's what we, that could be the future that we're creating. You know, it's, it's stories have the power to shift and, you know, shape the future. And if we're just telling these stories, you know, I watched, for fun, I watched Fury Road, the Mad Max kind of like the newer Mad Max, <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, story. And it's just like, is, is that the future, you know, is the future just like men and machines and uh, like, how to kill each other? Like, maybe, but it doesn't have to be, you know? And we, I, I just think it, we have to start telling st stories where there's another option. And the more we tell those stories that aren't like Blade Runner, you know, 2040 or whatever, where, uh, you know, women holograms are just like it's commodified you know uh, anyway that's very problematic a lot of levels that I won't get into but you know I just think we have to offer other options of like and there's one last tree on the planet you know no what does it look like for the planet to flourish what are what do indigenous features look like where native communities are thriving um what does it look like for there to be a change of guards for there to be more very more much more inclusion and equity in our in our um you know, governmental systems, uh, what, what are other options? You know, I, I just feel like we can tell, we can do better. And, and I, I think, you know, the issue with uh, like Hollywood and, and larger um, kind of like factory films is that, you know, they're selling kind of like, a, a, what do you call the word? You know, I mean, it's, 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 uh, I can't think of the term now, but you know, the predictable things to, to get a rise out of people and dystopia. <laughs> um, I don't know, we just, yeah, there are other ways to tell stories and we have to, I think the only option now is to be optimistic and hopeful to like see our way out of this. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. So what we'll do is we'll send you uh, the questions that are still pending uh, directly, so maybe you can answer them by email if you don't mind, Tiara. And uh, let's give Tiara another round of applause. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. For joining us and inspiring us and showing us new options. I'm going to quickly share my screen here and just wanted to acknowledge this was a great talk. And uh, coming up next week, we have Intention and Accident Decision Fields and Pattern Formation uh, with Miriam Dim, an artist uh, who is also working in the Bay Area. And we're very much looking forward to that. That's on September 24th. And uh, once again, I want to thank uh, uh, Tiara for speaking today. It was really fabulous to connect with you. And, and uh, we're going to see many of your uh, ideas are going to be picked up by our students and audience members in different ways. And we'll send you pictures and references as, as uh, the dialogue continues. So thank you so much for doing this. And thanks again to Hala and Edgar and also Paris for making all this happen. And uh, I think that's a wrap for today. So thank you so much. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.